Welcome to Kevin Deal Photography, where I take you on my journey through photography. It seems that no matter which corner you wander into in the YouTube photography world, artificial intelligence is what everybody's talking about. Well, that streak ends today. No, I'm just kidding. We're totally talking about AI. Today's episode is brought to you by Luminar Neo. You can check out the link in the description below or simply use the code KEVIN10 at checkout to get 10% off your copy of Luminar Neo today. And now, on to today's episode. Welcome to today's episode. If you're not familiar with Kevin Deal Photography, we do gear reviews, tips, techniques, and tutorials, and sometimes we dive into film. If any of that sounds appealing to you, click the subscribe button below. Generative AI. What is generative AI exactly? Well, it's not like content aware fills where you draw in an area and then it fills it in. You can actually type in what you want. It's pretty cool stuff. And on today's episode, we're gonna be mainly looking at what you can do with generative AI and portrait photography. But without any further ado, let's dive right into the edits. So first, let's start off with every studio photographer's arch nemesis, and that would be backdrops. Backdrops are the bane of my existence. I never want to think about the amount of cumulative time I have spent in my life editing backdrops. So if any company comes out with any sort of artificial intelligence that makes my life easier in the event that I have to edit backdrops, which is always, I'm gonna absolutely utilize that particular module. So let's see what I normally do. Right now we're gonna do a content aware fill. It's a tried and true method that we uh, studio photographers use. And you just go ahead and you omit the parts that you don't want it to look at. And then you go ahead and hit apply. And as you can see right here, it does an okay job, but it's left me with a lot of extra work. There's this weird texture up uh, toward the top of the frame. Uh, there's these weird uh, ripples that happen. And I have to pull out things like my patch tool or else I have to get my pen out and just kind of blend in certain colors to kind of even things out and make the backdrop look smoother. There's gotta be a better way. Well, in comes generative fill. I'm more or less tracing the exact same spot. Uh, now this is the area that I wanna work in. I'm gonna go ahead and just generate and see what the computer thinks uh, we ought to do here. Uh, so you can see the three options to the right. Option one was pretty good. Option two, I wasn't feeling, but option three looked pretty easy to edit. Is that perfect? No, but I don't see like millions of little ripples like I did when I did the content to wear fill. This is super easy to fix with a little patch tool. Uh, not a problem at all. This will save me a considerable amount of time with my backdrop. Okay, so I showed you a simple backdrop, but let's take a more complex scene. Okay, you've got this uh, very weathered area right here with graffiti everywhere, and you see the conduits off to the left. This is a very vulnerable image and that there's a lot of things that can really confuse the AI. But let's see what we can actually do with it. So first and foremost, I don't like how tight I was, so I'm gonna expand this out. I'm gonna use the crop tool and I'm gonna see how much uh, more environment I can bring into this shot in order to tell a story better. I'm gonna go ahead and do what I did before. I'm gonna trace the outer edge of this frame and then I'm just gonna uh, hit Command Shift I or I think it's Control Shift I on a Windows machine to select the inverse. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and hit Generate. But with a caveat, I'm gonna type in vandalism to see what happens. And what you're gonna see right here is, whoa, what is this? Well, Adobe, because these are licensed images, they have to protect themselves and graffiti can contain things like profanity and uh, vandalism and things like that, which could kind of get people into trouble. So they don't let you have that. So you gotta find a way around it. So how do we uh, get graffiti and get this scene to look the way we want it to look? Well, let's type in something like abandoned building and let's see what we get. Ah, there you go. We're looking through a doorway 
And now we see some extra uh, curricular activity going on on the ground here. There's a bunch of uh, more like shattered glass or rocks or just debris that wasn't there before. And the artificial intelligence did an incredible job of putting it in there. But I think this is uh, too easy. I think I could have done this uh, with Photoshop before we had generative fill. I wanna see if we can actually make this uh, a little bit more complex. I can always just find an old door, composite that picture on here, throw a little bit of debris in the foreground. I don't really think that that's uh, pushing this as far as I could push it. So I'm gonna have it analyze my image and then I'm just gonna have it apply it to the empty space you see surrounding it in white. Now look at that, uh, from a distance, that actually looks pretty convincing. Uh, you can see a window off to the right and the light actually lights up the model. And so the light is coming from the correct direction. Uh, the light fall off is happening more to the left and you can actually see that be the model's shadow side. The artificial intelligence correctly analyzed where the light was coming from how the light was hitting the model. And in the second, look at this. And by the way, you can see on the on the right side of the screen, there's three different selections. If you don't like the first one, go to the second one. The second one, you can actually see a window on the right side. So I may actually uh, go with that one instead of the first one because that one looks pretty awesome. And then there's the third one as well, which I'm not a fan of the third one as much as the second one, but it's there if you need it. And if you don't like any of the three, right above where you see those three uh, examples, you can hit generate again and Generate will uh, give you three new examples to choose from. It certainly never hurts to have options and being able to generate new options uh, just demonstrates the power of generative fill. Okay, if you've never been in this next scenario before, I do not believe that you're a portrait photographer. So as you can see right here, I think this is a pretty cool shot. Uh, however, I'm chopping her off at the legs. How many times have you been in a situation where like, I really like this shot, but I wish I could see my feet, or you wish you could see their feet because you wanna see more of the environment because you're doing environmental portraits. Generative fill can actually make this a passable and usable image in bringing in the feet. So grab your crop tool, you expand it out, you go ahead and trace out uh, your area, and then of course you uh, select the inverse. So we're gonna fill in the white. So you hit generate, it processes, you look at the entire scene and voila. You look at the scene and you're like, oh my gosh, the foreground filled. I can see more of the duck pond. I can see more of the trees. The AI did great, but wait, what's up with their feet? So you're looking at you're like, oh my gosh, she has duck feet. What's up with this? AI sucks. This is a stupid feature. Well, hold on. We've done one layer of artificial intelligence. We're gonna take this a step further. We're gonna go ahead and use our lasso tool and we're gonna circle the lower part around the legs and the feet and all that. And we're just gonna type in woman wearing boots. And now let's see what happens. We're gonna hit generate. And now look, two layers later, this looks like a very usable picture that a client would really like. There's a few small artifacts here and there that you may have to touch up on, but it's a hell of a lot better than not being able to replace somebody's lower legs and their feet, especially when someone is paying you and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't have that picture anywhere, I screwed up. This can save your ass. If you really think about it, like before, if somebody asked me, hey, can you replace my feet? They're not there, I would just say no. Now I can actually say yes. And that is the power of generative fill. Okay, we're gonna have a little bit of fun. This is a shot of a model I did a commercial job with in Canyon City. Uh, this is just a really awesome gorge, uh, but I'm gonna make her look like she's in the North Pole. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in the North Pole. And look, there you are, you're in the North Pole, you've got your nice uh, conifers. She looks dressed warm for it, but let's go ahead and dress her like Santa Claus. So I'm gonna type in woman wearing Santa Claus suit. And there you go. Now that looks a little cold, but whatever. Now we're gonna type a woman wearing a Santa Claus hat. And when you look off to the right, there's three different examples of Santa Claus hats you can try out. And of course, if you don't like them, you can hit generate again and it'll generate three more, three different Santa Claus hats. Uh, for all of you who are using this for all the wrong reasons, let's type in woman wearing a bikini. Let's go ahead, type in woman wearing a bikini. Hit generate and what do you see? <laughs> You can't do that. 
And the reason you can't do that is, as I had mentioned earlier about graffiti and vandalism and anything controversial, Adobe doesn't want any blowback on this. And so I'm sorry, but if you're shooting for a swimsuit line, you're just gonna have to look for artificial intelligence somewhere else. But this is actually a pretty good idea on their part to protect them from liability. Just make sure you're typing in things that are kosher and things that aren't gonna get you into trouble. So now that we've gone through some examples of generative fill, this artificial intelligence, I'm gonna tell you my thoughts. So now that I've had time to use the generative fill feature, artificial intelligence inside of Photoshop beta, what are my thoughts on it? My thoughts are that this could be a very promising tool for some of you, especially if you work in commercial photography. Let's say a model shows up in the wrong outfit. You can literally trace them and replace the outfit as long as you don't do anything too scandalous. You can change the color of a jacket. You can change a background. If you're a landscape photographer and you're like, oh man, I cropped in a little bit too much. Well, you can crop out and then just use the generative fill to fill the rest of your landscape. Now, some of you may argue that that's cheating and who am I to tell you that it's not or that it is? You have to use your own subjective opinion and determine as to whether or not that is cheating. Now, I'm pretty old school. I like to get everything right at the camera. So I only use a tool like this if I have to. I wanna capture everything at the camera because my goal in life is to be as good of a photographer as I can be. And to me, photography has to do with capture. Editing is a completely different art form. It's why there are some people out there that all they do is edit images. That's not me. I like to do as little editing as possible, but sometimes you just have no choice. You got paid to do a shoot. You're like, oh crap, I screwed up and I cut off their feet. Well, you can fill their feet back in. That's pretty awesome stuff. One thing I can see that can become a problem is there used to be a time where people would be ignorant and they're like, well, you can just change my shirt, right? Well, no, that's a lot of Photoshopping, right? You know, if you're, if you're watching this and you're like, yeah, let me just uh, take a denim shirt and make it like silk. Like you can't do that really fast. That's a really long Photoshop job. That's a really expensive Photoshop job. But now with the generative fill, you can actually do a pretty good job of that. And once your clients find out, they're probably going to knock your door down and it's going to suck because they're going to be like, change this, change that, change this. I want to see what it looks like when it looks like that. So I could see some problems being created by this, some extra work that maybe you don't want to do, just charge more for it. You know, this generative AI could definitely help some of you be more artistic. Maybe you have limited resources. Maybe you have a mind that has a lot of things going on in it, but you don't have the money to build elaborate sets. You don't have the money to go to a really beautiful landscape to shoot a model at. Who am I to tell you that you can't use that as your backdrop? If people like the picture, people like the picture. I do think that generative AI can save your butt in a lot of uh, situations, and it can also act as a uh, assistant when it comes to being artistic. And so uh, it's not my place to tell you uh, whether or not you should use this or not, but I am telling you that it's uh, it's a very powerful tool. It's not 100% there yet. I think uh, it ha it's like 1024 on the long side. I have to remember those pixels off the top of my head, but basically uh, if you do one really large edit, it's going to make the long side like 1024 or something like that. And so when you're dealing with Fuji GFX 100S files, that could be an issue. So you need to edit in smaller increments uh, when you make the generative fills. And then that way you can keep the file size larger. It's just a little cheat, a little workaround. I'm assuming that once computers get a little faster, uh, when the AI gets a little bit more efficient, that uh, Adobe will expand that uh, pixel count and it will get somewhere pretty crazy in no time. Uh, something else to keep in mind about this is it's in the beta version right now. It's not in your regular Photoshop. And when it does become uh, available for Photoshop, it's probably something you're going to have to pay extra for because uh, to my knowledge, it's using Adobe stock images and Adobe wants to pay royalties out to the people who made those images and they deserve to be compensated for it. So uh, but I don't know, maybe there'll be kind of an in-between because I don't pay anybody when I uh, I don't really use Sky Replacement, but every now and then I show people how to use Sky Replacement and it doesn't ask me for money when I use Sky Replacement. I think you can buy more Skies, I'm not sure because I don't really use artificial Skies. But the whole asset aspect of it, like, oh, hey, you have to pay uh, for this generative fill, 
uh, that might turn some people off. You know, I'm, I'm kind of of the opinion that when I pay for a program, I just want to be able to use the program and not have any limitations, but uh, maybe I'm in the minority. I'm starting to see some artificial intelligence uh, companies that when you send the stuff and it's doing like online AI generation, that they charge you by the image. Uh, it's not unheard of. Retouchers charge you by the image. There's just something that feels a bit dirty to me about Adobe charging me for generative uh, fill AI by the image. Anyway, that's today's episode. Uh, I do think that generative fill is going to be a really cool uh, feature moving forward. I just have to see how it's implemented. If you felt like you learned something today, uh, tell me about it in the comments below. If I got something wrong, I mean, I'm not an editor. I'm a uh, photographer first, so maybe I gave some wrong advice or whatever. Call me out. Tell me in the comments below. I'm humble. I, I don't have an ego about that kind of stuff. We're all here to learn. If you like this channel, I humbly ask you, click the subscribe button below. And until next time, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.